Hello, welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Before we get started, as always, just a reminder, if you haven't done so yet, please sign up for my newsletter at jasonpereira.ca, where you'll get notification of all my podcasts and every other media piece I do. And given the listenership numbers on this, I know not all of you have signed up for that newsletter yet, so please get on that. On to today's show. Today on the show, I have Alex Lazaro, venture capitalist and author of Out Innovate, how global entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are rewriting the rules of Silicon Valley. This was a fascinating conversation on how entrepreneurs around the world approach different problems differently in order to achieve success. And with that, here's my interview with Alex. Hello, Alex. Hello. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, and thank you for spending some of your quarantine time with us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I have been quarantining before it was fashionable. My wife and I had a kid in uh, middle of February. And so right after I was coming back from paternity leave, the work from home order came into effect. So I have been uh, at home for a while already. Well, uh, so ahead of the trend, like uh, like the technology topics we're going to be talking about today, <laughs> but also um, I, I sympathize with your lack of sleep. So <laughs> Alex Lazaro, author, uh, global venture capitalist, author of Out Innovate. Tell us about Out Innovate. Yeah, happily. So Out Innovate, How Global Entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit Are Rewriting the Rules of Silicon Valley is my new book released today on our day of recording. Everything we think we know about startup best practices rooted in a time and a place, Silicon Valley and today, for a very particular type of asset light, software-based company that wants to grow extraordinarily fast. Mm -hmm. And yet, Around the world, the best entrepreneurs are not only challenging these conventional wisdoms, are increasingly reinventing startup best practice in some meaningful ways. And so the book is about that, and it tells their stories. So moving away from the constant uh, themes that we hear, like move fast and break things, and uh, simply looking at how other companies are moving forward in what are non-Valley conventional ways. Yeah, and in some ways, the reason I wrote this book my day job, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. I invest in startups. I work for a firm called Cathay Innovation, globally focused venture firm that invests across Asia, Europe, North America, and Africa. Um, but outside of work, I've been teaching an MBA class at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies, which is Middlebury College's graduate program in Monterey. And a lot of my students were you know, moving back home to their hometowns. I'm, you know, I'm from Winnipeg in the middle of Canada, or they were moving to emerging market countries to start their companies. And I kept assigning my students books and uh, topics on innovation, but the best practice that was available were books from Silicon Valley on how to grow really fast or build your product in whatever way. And for everything I shared, I felt like I had to contextualize it with the reality of building startups in more emerging ecosystems. And that, so that was the genesis of the book. And Jason, to your question or to your point a second ago around some of these mantras like move fast and break things or these ideas of growing at all costs, I think that's exactly right. I think that there is this conventional wisdom on how you do it. And then there is the reality of how you actually build a company um, in other ecosystems. And yeah. Well, ahead. I wouldn't even say just other ecosystems. I mean, we've talked about this in our, in our pre-interview is that a lot of the companies that the companies that survive to tell the story, we're not paying attention to the graveyard of companies that did the exact same thing that those companies did. And yeah, the, you know, the victors basically talk about how they took these chances and made these risks and acted a certain way and it worked for them. But what about all the companies that didn't work for? So it's not like they've unlocked some sort of master secret to the universe as to how to get from point A to point B, right? It just, it's just what worked for their story. It's interesting. One of the themes I'm interested in is this idea of risk-adjusted success. Hmm. So in the Valley, we have this notion of chasing unicorns. And unicorns is the colloquial term for a startup that's worth over a billion dollars. But actually, it's more than that. It's also a philosophy on how to build companies. And if that's the philosophy, the method is this idea of growing at any cost. Outside the Valley, I coined the term of the camel. It's this idea of balance growth. It's businesses that still want to grow really fast, but that also infuse their business with sustainability and resilience from the get-go. Why, why did I call it the camel? Unlike the unicorn, it's a real animal that lives in real lands. It can drink faster, it would drink water faster than any animal and sprint when it needs to, but at the same time, it can survive the world's harshest environments. And how do they do that? They do it by one, building a business model that works they don't subsidize usage. They don't give away products for free. They charge for the value they create. Two, they manage costs and burn. And three, they take a long-term view. And what that means is that the outcome of that is you still grow, you still benefit from network effects, but you do it with managing risk and managing the downside. The story that I really like is the story of Grubhub, 
which is a Chicago-based company that does on-demand delivery. And we often think of on-demand delivery as one of these models that's really still called value subsidized. You know, DoorDash competitor, for instance, raised $1.5 billion. But Grubhub got to an IPO having raised, you know, less than $100 million of venture capital, a paltry amount in comparison to, to others. But they did it by taking this approach of charging for the value they created by managing burn and by taking a long-term outlook. I interviewed Mike Evans, the COO and co-founder, and he talked about how he could have gotten an IPO instead of eight or nine years, two years faster, but having done so at tremendously more risk and with a lot more capital. And he chose this more balanced growth approach that still got him to the same place, but at a more uh, efficient, effective, and lower risk path. And I think that's really the lesson there is that, that we can build incredible companies, but doing it with a camel-like philosophy instead of this unicorn one. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because what you're discussing is, I'd say, not growth at any cost, but growth in wisdom. It's not basically being on a lifeline at all times. I mean, we also talked about uh, in our pre-call about uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. And anyone who's read that book basically has read about how that company should have blown up on probably five or six occasions because of outlandish risk that he chose to basically go into. And again, you run that simulation a thousand times and maybe 10 times it succeeds. I'm not trying to belittle the entire growth at any cost unicorn type approach, but I think that it works in lots of places. I think in in winner take all, fast, competitive, you got to move fast to to win type markets that are massively scalable. Absolutely. I think you have to throw a ton of money at the problem and run as hard and as fast as possible. Otherwise, someone else is going to get there and take it away from you. However, for most businesses, I don't know that that strategy works, quite honestly. It's, it's really interesting. And I, I think in some ways, the prime example of the philosophy you're talking about is this idea of blitzscaling, which is Reed Hoffman and Chris Yeh's, uh book. Mm-hmm. And you know, in their book, they readily admit that their approach is really for a very small subset of businesses and markets, right? Winner takes all markets where there's a lot of competition and you really need to scale. And in that very narrow circumstance, it makes sense to subsidize, to really raise a ton of capital. The problem is, is that I think we've extrapolated that model to too many. I think that model is applicable for like 1% of venture-backed companies who are themselves 1% of all startups. And so for the 99.99% of companies, I think this more balanced growth approach is, is appropriate. And in some ways how, and I think your listeners will appreciate this, in some ways what we're talking about here is managing the value of death. So the value of death in a startup is the cumulative amount of cash that's burned in service of building a sustainable business. And, you know, in many startups, right, at the beginning, there's very low revenues and you have to invest for future growth. The question is, is what do those curves look like? And in the Silicon Valley model, the cash curve at the bottom is pulled really deeply down in service of ramping up the revenue curve as fast as possible up. And that approach works well, but if you take a little bit of the balanced growth approach in most other circumstances where it's more appropriate, what you're doing is you're actually managing that burn and you're still growing, but you're managing it in a, in a way that you can control it. And the Grubhub story, instead of a valley of death, I think of it as actually ditches of death. They had little spurts of growth that got them to burn, and then they kind of come back up to sustainability, and then they raised more capital, and then they did another burn. And so they were able to fund their growth over time, taking that approach. I think the case study of Qualtrics is another really interesting example. It's a company based out of Salt Lake City. They started doing surveys for universities. And when I was interviewing uh, Ryan, the founder, he was talking about how in the first 10 years, they hadn't even figured out their big breakthrough. Their big breakthrough happened in year 12, 13, when they switched the enterprise model. They had never taken venture capital, but the fact that they were profitable throughout, that they had this long-term approach and they had really managed the burn, gave them the opportunity to continue iterating into what became their killer product a long time later. They did end up raising venture capital, but a lot of it was for secondary, and they ultimately sold to SAP for uh, $8 billion. I mean, so I think a really good example of this, of this approach. And obviously, this doesn't work for, for everyone in this ditches approach, but I think the philosophy of going into it with balanced growth, res- with resiliency, and with the sustainability is for everyone. So how many companies did you talk to in creating this book? This is about a two-year effort. I interviewed about 200 entrepreneurs from around the world. Hmm. They're entrepreneurs that are leading some of the biggest companies, a couple hundred million dollars, a couple billion in geography spanning, you know, obviously in the US and North America and the Midwest, but also in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East. So really all over. And, you know, I talk about in the book, this idea of the frontier. And in reality, it isn't a matter of that there's Silicon Valley and there's frontier. The reality is more nuanced, right? There are a bunch of dimensions. I'd probably simplify it as 
uh, two, just for the sake of argument here, one is how developed the local country is, uh, developing versus developed, and another is how strong the local startup ecosystem is. And obviously, if, if you're going to do two by two matrix, you'd say maybe in top right, you'd have places like Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv, you know, developed country, developed startup ecosystem. Bottom left, you might have a developing country and a developing startup ecosystem. So I cover some nascent efforts in Pyongyang, for instance, in North Korea. But then in the other corners, you might okay, say- Okay, well, let's, well, well, let's start. First of all, you went from the States to South Korea, so that must have been a venture to get there in the first place or to get that contact. What is going on in North Korea that I don't know about in the fintech scene <laughs> <laughs> or the technology scene? So the reason I do that, by the way, in the book, and just to finish the thought real quick on, yeah, sorry, on uh, Bangalore on one side, yep. right, developing country, developed market, or you know, perhaps Winnipeg, Right, developed country in Canada, developing startup ecosystem. In some ways, you really can tell the story of the extremes by showing one side or the other. But then by going to these other quadrants, you can also show some of the nuances. And obviously, what's going on in Bangalore versus Winnipeg is very different. But it's important to understand what's happening in different ecosystems. That's the reason I do it in the book. To your question on Pyongyang specifically, one of the folks that I interviewed was a was Jeffrey C, who leads a program called the Chosan Exchange. And so one of the things that I've seen is that Global entrepreneurs are often looking to build their innovations, but also contributing to their innovation ecosystems. And the Chosan Exchange, basically, uh, Jeffrey was helping to foster the early beginnings of entrepreneurship within the North Korean context by essentially bringing folks from the region into the country, giving lessons. There's actually a very narrow context where workers can build a business in partnership with government entities. And so anyways, he was doing his efforts on training the startup ecosystem. And so I wouldn't say Pyongyang is where we're going to learn uh, startup approaches from. But the example that I have in the book is much more about, look, we're seeing entrepreneurs helping build their ecosystems everywhere, even in, in the most extreme environments that we see. And, and that was the example that I was referring to there. Pretty extreme environment. So, okay, that's so now that we've covered probably the um, least likely place you would think that you would visit, but you actually did research in. What's the most unconventional story of how a company basically got from point A to point B that you've heard? So, the list would be long, but one of the things that I think is interesting and really surprising is this notion of having to build the full stack. A company mm -hmm. called Giaboso in Brazil is a really great example. So, they are a Brazilian personal finance manager. Right, think of mint.com or something like that. In Silicon Valley or in the US, Mint scaled by acquiring users and then partnering with something like something called Yodli on the back end, which did all the bank interconnections. And then when they wanted to monetize, they offered loans to their customers, leveraging both FICO, the credit scoring infrastructure, and an ecosystem of banks and fintech lenders that were willing to pay for customers on the platform. And that was how Mint uh, was created. In Brazil, Gilb also had to do it completely differently. For one, there was no Yodli. There was no bank interconnection right. layer. And so just to be able to build their personal finance manager, right? It, it just doesn't work for someone to put in their transactions. You just get this phenomenon of, of gigo, garbage in, garbage out. You really need to get the transactions. They had to build that layer entirely themselves. So they, to build the personal finance manager, they also built a Plaid or a Yodli. And then to monetize, they said, well, we really need to understand the credit score of our customers, right? Brazil has some of the highest interest rates in the world and some of the highest rates of short-term debt. And yet no one understands their credit profile. In fact, there's no credit score in the way we have it here. There's a, a blacklist. You're either in default or you're not. And there's no nuance in between. Yeah. And so to solve that, he actually created a credit karma like platform just to help people understand what their credit profile was. And then to monetize down the line, you have to always do that. He wanted to uh, help his customers get better, get better options and get better um, lower cost credit and things like that. But there wasn't this ecosystem. And so here again, he had to build it. And so uh, Ben and Tiago, the two co-founders, literally built a white label platform, opened it up to the banks. And so to build a single product, a PFM, monetizable in the way we do in the Valley, they actually had to do four separate individual business. They had to build the full stack to do it. And this, I don't think is an aberration. I think it's a standard across so many different businesses around the emerging markets, which is having to build a bunch of enabling infrastructure just to be able to build the ultimate product. Think of what Flipkart or some of the e-commerce players have done in other emerging markets. They had to build their own logistics stream. They had to build their own cash on delivery approach. But the lesson that's really powerful in this is when you're building really tough businesses, when you're creating a market in emerging markets or in Silicon Valley as well, you actually have to do a bunch of things to make that work. 
And learning how to do that and learning how to make those choices is pretty critical. And so that's, I think, the big takeaway that we can get from it. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, all I can think about right now is that everyone who's in technology listening to this better bow down and thank God for the AWSs and the Yodlies and the Plaids and all the infrastructure providers of the world for basically allowing them to start with a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the manpower, and a fraction of the effort to get from ideation to actual deliverable. And uh, yeah, when, you, when you're not facing that, I mean, your example there where, hey, let's just solve the entire ecosystem problem before we come up to a product that can be monetized. Now, that being said, that is a pretty big moat once you've built it. I mean, I can't imagine that they're seeing a ton of competition in Brazil in that space or the likes of Plaid are saying, yeah, we're just going to move into Brazil and do the exact same thing right now. I think that's such a key insight that you have because I think you're totally right. In one of the big recurring themes in the book is that within a context of adversity, there are advantages that come about. And in the book, I talk about this as the full stack moat, which is if you are building a full stack, obviously the mountain is that much harder to climb to start. But once you're at the top, it's so much harder for everyone else to follow. In, in Gilboso's case, as is the case for a lot of these full stack companies that have to do this, I think one is you've done a bunch of stuff and that's hard, but there's a bunch of other nuances to the moat that are powerful. So second is you've got a capital moat. There aren't that many investors that are investing in Brazil relative to investors in the Valley. And if you are the first building this, you are locking down a number of them and often some of the better ones if, you're, if your business is doing well. And so you're locking out future competition from that. If you're finding the talent base of folks that have built startups and scaled them in fintech with this very specific model, you can be locking up the talent as well. So there's a bunch of advantages that come with these challenges as well that I think are underappreciated, but I I think are very powerful. In a country where capital intensive flows are limited into startups, you've also got that advantage, as you said, but then you're you're basically, you're also a platform at this point. And as we know, every company in the world would love to be a platform because quite frankly, you can just, for lack of a better term, extract rent from anyone sitting on top of you, right? And become infinitely more valuable because, hey, now you're, everything else is built on top of you. I mean, Facebook's been trying to be called a platform for a quite long time because of that. But yeah, nevertheless, so, so Brazil, uh, full stack mode, what other key major themes did you see happening across the different domiciles you visited? The list is long, but actually I'll riff on your point around the platform, which I think is a key insight, which is this notion that in many markets outside the Valley, people are not obsessed with this idea of being a disruptor. Often they are creators. And this is more than semantics. In the Valley, we're obsessed with this idea of disruption. Where does it come from? It's Clayton Christensen's research. Mm -hmm. He started it actually in the uh, steel industry. They were integrated steel mills and they were leaving part of the market underserved. And so these mini mills started nibbling at the bottom and just doing products and services that integrated ones didn't want to do. And over time, they got better and better and bigger and bitter. And, and the mini mills essentially were able to serve the entire market. And so it's this modern day David and Goliath story where the Goliath was unable to serve the market and, and the small player, the nimbler player, the more innovative player won. And that's the narrative that we have in the Valley for everything, where there is an inefficient incumbent that is not serving the market, and, and we will disrupt them with a new attitude, a new approach to the business. But the reality is in many markets where there isn't a formal financial service, where there isn't a high-quality education system or high-quality healthcare system or a logistics infrastructure, the best entrepreneurs are not disruptors. They are creators. And they're offering a product or service, often through a business model or technological innovation for the first time, or they're formalizing something that didn't exist. And two, they're doing it for the mass market, not just the top of the pyramid. They're really finding a mass market solving problem. And the third is, often they're doing this with a platform approach in mind. One of the stories I like, which is actually not strictly a pure play startup in the traditional sense, is an organization called Mpesa, which uh, in Kenya, right, they're offering a mobile banking service. It was actually a startup within Safaricom, a big corporate that was seed funded by DFID, the aid agency of the UK, and has turned into now one of their biggest revenue platforms for the business, but also the leading mobile banking player Mm -hmm. in Kenya and one of the leaders and examples around the world where 90% of adults have an account and it's really used. But the key insight on this is that not only are they a mobile banking platform that allows people to send money to different places, buy airtime, whatever, they've actually enabled a whole crop of other startups to be built on top. And so things like, for instance, off-grid energy, 
that can be built only because of the platform of M-Pesa. And I'll give you an example. There's a company called M-Copa, which was actually founded by one of the founders of M-Pesa, which imagine a couple of solar panels, a battery, some lights, a basic fan, a radio, that kind of thing, where you can turn a family that had kerosene lighting to have modern light overnight for the same amount of money. But the reason it works is because while they can't afford the 100 bucks for the system up front, they can't afford the same daily, monthly, weekly pay that they were paying for kerosene. And so through mobile money, you can offer essentially a loan collateralized by this physical energy product and accept small little incremental payments that would have been completely logistically impossible to do before, but all of a sudden because of mobile banking, you can, because of this digital infrastructure, you can. And so that's one of the things that's really interesting is because of that, you can do all these things. And now MCOPA itself, their approach to pay as you go itself can also be a platform where they can do energy, but they can also do a whole swath of other products and services and enable others too. And so I think we're seeing some of the best innovators taking this creative mindset, creator's approach, and mm-hmm. being the shoulders on upon which the shoulders of giants upon which others can build as well. And it's interesting you mentioned Clayton Christensen there because his last book, I think, before he passed was The Prosperity Paradox, where he kind of talked along the lines of what you're talking about here, which is oftentimes businesses or opportunity seekers look at the lack of consumption as proof that a market is not ready for something, whereas others look at it as proof that the market's just not being serviced properly and figure out the infrastructure in order to do that. There was a specific case, I can't remember which African country it was, where there was no, the cellular footprint was non-existent. And someone came in there and quite literally built up the entire cellular infrastructure, figured out how to do it on a reduced cost at an affordable way. And also, I think, literally had to negotiate with the warlords in the area as to how to put these things up. And now is reaping the benefits of, of not only basically providing cellular coverage to an entire country, but also becoming the platform for which all the, all the transactions that happen on it. So, so yeah, I think your what you just hit upon is 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 definitely something that is is notable is the need to find opportunity in the building of even the fundamentals, not just the you may have gotten into it for one thing, but the opportunity to build the platform is, is even more powerful than the one thing you decided on in the first place. And by the way, Jason, I and I resonate with that completely. We're talking about examples in far off lands, but this is an example of where I use extreme examples to really shine a light on where we are in in, in North America, in the US or in Canada. And you know, we have a far range set of social problems we need to solve here as well. And mm-hmm. when I ask my friends or my students, you know, which entrepreneurs they think are really reshaping an industry and really creating a new approach, you know, they might suggest someone like Elon Musk, that'd be who would be on the top of my list. Yep. But when I ask them, give me two or three other names, they really struggle. And I can point to dozens of Elons all across the emerging markets. And I think that we need more of that here. And the lessons on how to do that will come from folks from around the world. And so I agree. We need that kind of, we need that kind of, forget about the, it's the difference between uh, sustaining innovation and, um, oh, what's the first one? (laughs) Uh, Disruptive innovation versus sustaining innovation, right? Like so much of the innovation we see is sustaining and very few people actually are the, the true disruptors. And you know, I have a client who's actually one of the world's, well, one of the North, at least North America's foremost authorities on solar energy. And over lunch, we were discussing just the future of, of solar cars. And he's, oh, sorry, of uh, electric cars. And he said, you know what, honestly, if it wasn't for that one guy, we would be nowhere right now. And it's just, it's terrifying to think about how it just took one guy Terrifying it, and you know, at the same time, uh, inspiring to think about how it took one person to pivot the entire direction of the automotive industry after decades of ignoring this issue. It's amazing, right? And and I think he's demonstrated what can be done, and all of a sudden now everyone is trying to catch up. And he's really, yep. I think, one is I'm a big believer in the company and their business model and their cars, uh, but also I think his biggest contribution is isn't in the direct impact that he's having per customer, it's actually by reshaping this industry. And I think that's, I think that's the power. Yep. And I think, uh, and he's, you know, he's, he's done it again with rocketry to some degree, just less of a consumer facing issue. But I mean, frankly, it's, uh, yeah, the, that being said, it's really cool to watch those two booster rockets land back on earth at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> like, totally. That was the first time you pulled that off. It was so perfect. I'm like, is that real? Like that, <laughs> that is too well done. Uh, but anyway, so before we wrap up three questions, I ask everyone, and then we're going to plug the book on one last chance. So uh, first question, if you had one wish for something you could change on whether it's the company you work in or the industry as a whole, or we'll go extend to the world as a whole, what would it be? I think to tie back to our conversation so far, I think that it would be one, this mindset of looking for models within the Valley. I think we're really tied to 
looking and aspiring to the best entrepreneurs here. I hope that we look more and more to the best entrepreneurs outside the Valley and we really shift that approach. And critically, I think it's this idea of being a creator. And the other one that I mentioned is this notion of cross-pollinator, of learning from the best entrepreneurs and vice versa, having this bilateral exchange of ideas so that we can inspire others, but also learn from as well and, and adapt our business models from there. I mean, it sounds like it's the theme of your book is that we need to start doing that. So uh, well plugged. Second question for you, what was the biggest challenge in basically writing this book and what did you to overcome that? Writing this book was an exercise for me in empathy towards the founders I serve in the sense that, you know, obviously this is one millionth as hard as what a founder is doing, actually building a business. And yet it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And the hardest thing for me was it wasn't the actual act of writing. It wasn't finding cases or entrepreneurs to interview. It wasn't getting the ideas. It was actually just continuing to go and believing that this book had to come out and believing that this book was worth writing and that people might care without any data points at any point in time. And some folks saying, oh, I really like the idea and others being pretty discouraging. And amidst that, continue to push forward and, and really believing that I wanted to do it and that I thought it was a good idea. And hopefully it is. I think that kind of entrepreneurial journey was for me this this exercise in, in empathy I, I was talking about. Well, it's it's funny you mentioned just the the writing of the book because to me, as much as I do a lot of writing, it's painful. And uh, I've always said, if you, you want to understand why uh, why uh, so many authors end up being a stereotypical alcoholic, try writing a book. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's painful. So uh, last question for you. What is it that, normally it's about the company, but let me just ask you this question outside the context of the company. So normally the question is, what is it that excites you about? What it is you're working on that gets you up every morning and keeps you going? I'm going to ask you about that, but I want you to think about the context of, of that question during the middle of the writing of the book, you're writing this book, you're putting together this content, and you're standing on the barrel of having to deliver on this thing. What was it that kept you going and, didn't, and made you not abandon the project midway? It was the hope that I could be on this podcast with you. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> um, as a venture capitalist, you could have gone in on that angle, but author is a harder, harder grind. <laughs> so to be honest, I have one motivation and, you know, there's a reason I went into venture capital and it's the same reason I almost did a PhD in developmental economics and worked in, in government and, and worked for a variety of things in the social sector is that I'm really motivated on, on social impact and on solving some of the world's biggest challenges. And the reason I did it, taking the lens of venture capital and investing in uh, tech for good style businesses is that I actually think there's a really big opportunity in this moment right now through technology and through business model innovation that wasn't possible before to reimagine some solution to them. And, and the off-grid energy example is one. And what get, got me going Every day was that this is kind of really part of this. And this is really hopefully going to help an next generation of entrepreneurs start the conversation about what it takes to scale and to succeed in their ecosystems. And I thought that was really important. And I wanted to help shape and be part of that conversation. Yeah, and I commend you on that because honestly, it's, it's all too often um, people get caught up in the stereotypes and tropes that are common to their industry and getting a lens from outside. I mean, one of the best things I think you can do to expand your horizons in thinking is to travel. And, you know, if you can actually, I say it's even better to try to live as a native for at least a little while while you're there to really understand what life is like in these places. And I think what you did was the, was the entrepreneurial or venture capital equivalent of that very journey. It was to look at different companies in different environments that, that frankly, I think these stories are going to not only resonate, but also provide value to different entrepreneurs who maybe they, maybe, maybe there's parts of the Silicon Valley ethos that just don't resonate with them or scare them or whatever it is. And seeing that there's more than one way to succeed is valuable. So thank you. I very much look forward to it. So tell us uh, again, full title of the book and where the people can find it. Absolutely. Title of the book is Out Innovate, How Global Entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are rewriting the rules of Silicon Valley. And it just did its worldwide release with Harvard Business Review Press, as well as the audiobook with Audible. So you can find it anywhere where books are sold, uh, including on Amazon or major booksellers. And you can also follow me or sign up for my newsletter at alexlazaro.com uh, or on Twitter at alexlazaro. Excellent. Alex, thank you yet again. And I encourage everyone to check out the book or if you're like me, the audio book, because it's just easier to get through that in a busy day. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. Thanks a lot for having me. This is a lot of fun. Have a good yeah. one. Take care. So that was my interview with Alex Lazaro on his book, Out Innovate. I highly encourage you to pick up a copy and give it a read because we just scratched the surface of the fascinating stories of the different places he visited and the different people he talked to. So as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. 
This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.